and crazier and nicer and crazier seemingly at the same time ad nauseum as it's been since the beginning of time since the the dawning of the age but yeah yo uh i hope that y'all have been socially distanced i hope that y'all have been practicing you know uh, 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 uh good hygiene washing the hands you feel me the most basic of directions the things that we should have been taught from kindergarten wash y'all hands Make sure y'all not putting your hands in your faces excessively or for no reason, you feel me? Because I've been seeing some of these politicians on some wildness. Now, I like to kind of keep it family friendly family friendly here, but, uh, you know, they pushing it. Because they telling us to be doing certain things and make sure we on it and make sure we doing this. And they just be doing stuff for the, for the, for the, for the optics. I mean, I guess what else is new, right? Because it's, it's politics. Like, what else? That's just what the name of the game is. But I feel like a lot of people forget that. I feel like a lot of people are watching the news, political cycles, and I think I think the past presidency, that sort of cycle, that that term reveals a whole lot about uh, how gullible people are, really. Like, in general. Like, I'm not talking to you specifically. I'm just saying, in general, the, the masses don't seem to be, or there are enough people that are not, are not smart, not inquisitive, not apprehensive. They don't go and dig and find their own information about things and make sure that they understand what they're doing. Uh, a lot of people really think that these politicians are on it. And sorry to be uh, the man behind the curtain. You know, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. I know if, if, if y'all remember that reference, and y'all, you know, I'm a little washed, I guess, I don't know. But if y'all remember that reference, Leave a like, leave a comment down below for my YouTube people. Um, but people really think that they be on here, like on it, you know? like on, And like they really believe what they're saying. Half the time they really don't. Half the time it's just so that y'all can vote them back in. It's so that they can pander to whoever is, whoever they're in the pocket of. You know, whoever's funding their campaigns. Um, they end up getting their paychecks. They end up doing what they got to do. And it's, it's, it's really interesting with this politician kind of thing, this politics thing. Uh, it doesn't seem like a lot of people, at least in the, or the mainstream media, or just the media in general, mainstream media, I guess, they're not really painting a lot of, they're not putting a spotlight on politicians' salaries and what they're bringing in. You know, I thought it was cool when Bloomberg was not accepting pay as the mayor of New York. I think he accepted like $1, and I think Trump was, wasn't was accepting, you know, a whole bunch of pay for for being the president, because he's already wealthy, and then... Bloomberg was, is already a billionaire, so he's like, dude, what do I need? What do I need 100k a year for? What do I need 200k a year for? Like, I make that in a day. Like, what are you talking about? You feel me? Because Bloomberg owns mad, just owns stuff. So, uh, I saw it. It was it was an interesting story or an interesting thing that happened up in Canada. Uh, there was this one. I think it was in Canada. Was it in Canada? I think it was in Canada. Anyway, y'all look it up. I'll probably see if I can get the uh, get the article, get the story down in the in in, in, in the description. And for all of y'all YouTube, for all of y'all y'all listening on the sound of my voice, I do my best to try to include links to the things that I talk about uh, in this podcast, so that y'all can just go see for yourselves, uh, enjoy the the details and the nuances of what that article is. I'm just here talking about my takes. I report on it, uh, and then just put it in the description, and y'all can go see what those sources are. Go check it out. Go enjoy. That's how that's how I do it with, with my recommendations in the recommendation section of this podcast for those who are who who's whom who's who's the for those of you hmm, having a brain fart talking about washed uh, for those of you whom this episode is your first. Uh, that's how we do it. I've got a recommendations uh, segment at the very end. Some things that I've been enjoying. Whether it's books, whether it's music, whether it's TV, whether it's internet, whatever it is, I make sure to share it with y'all. So maybe some of y'all might like it. Some of y'all that might not necessarily have, have been aware of it. Or maybe something that y'all were aware of that maybe you didn't try. You've got another person going, yo, get out there, try it, because it's pretty fire. Uh, that's what I do with my recommendations. I'll put the links down in the description uh, of, the, of the podcast, of the audio, and of the video. Oh, and if this is your first podcast and you're uh, with us for the first time and you're listening to this 
we do have a video component to this on on YouTube. Check us out on the Social Millennial Podcast. Our socials are at Social Millennial Pod if, if y'all want to uh, connect more with us in a more holistic way. You feel me? We try to do Twitter. The the the, the Twitter's there, but eh, we're probably gonna get off of Twitter. I just don't. Uh, call me washed. It's just it's not a platform that that I could get into necessarily that others are are able to get into. So I'm just you know. Play, play to the strengths. You feel me? We play to the strengths. So, uh, let's talk about politics. There was a story out in Canada. Uh, there was a member of Parliament, the member of the legislature, who thought that it was trash. Because for those who don't know, Canada is in lockdowns now. Um, in certain places, it's like all the way lockdowns. They've got curfews and everything. You can't be uh, out after a certain amount of time. I mean, after a certain time of day except for doing certain kinds of things. Like, it's really not a joke. They've been jailing people, they've been finding people. Um, some of the provinces have found it to be, I think some of the provinces in Canada have challenged it, and there are certain certain aspects of their lockdowns that have been found to be unconstitutional, according to, to, to Canada's uh, legislature. But there was this one, one, uh, one dude that was like, yo, we're still getting paid, guap. Like, we're locking down the country and all these different provinces are locking down. People are losing their jobs in droves and are relying on government stipends and so on that they can barely get by on. But our salaries are not touched. We're good. We're making 150 k 200 a year easy. We don't get hit by, by any of these lockdowns. Um, and he was like, yo, we have to, he introduced a bill, a plan to scale back everybody's salaries. You know, while while they're in this 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 emergency time and lockdowns and so on, that that some of that money should go to the community and to helping all of the provinces and to getting us out of this COVID nineteen crisis. Uh, he put that thing forward. You know, he that to, to to downsize the salaries, um, and unanimously, the legislature was like, "No, fam, we're not going to do that." Unanimously, and one of the other dudes were so salty that he introduced a counter bill to only uh, uh, take down or, or, or uh, downsize this dude, the, the other dude who did the bill to downsize, every, to downsize everybody's salary, to downsize his salary down. So he's making less money than everybody else's and the money that, that he proposed. Now, thankfully, everybody else saw that to be kind of trash to, to do, uh, to try to counter him with a bill to, just to make him not get paid or get paid the amount of money that he said everybody else should get. But like it was on some childish wildness. But it got me thinking like there are people that really think that these politicians are out for your benefit. Like that that's their only, the only thing that they get out of politics. Like for real, for real. A lot of people seemingly, I don't know if it's, you know, blissfully unaware, blissfully ignorant of the real world. You know, you kind of want the world to work a certain way in your own mind. And the world instantly becomes a scarier place when you notice or acknowledge that the way that things are supposed to work are not how they work. And especially in the realm of, of politics and you're in front of the camera, and you're in front of people, that they're putting out this sort of uh, this facade that they are a certain thing, but really behind the scenes it's something else. It was something inter interesting along those, those lines that I came across uh, um, on this one podcast, uh, kept on stage. Uh, they were talking about uh, like why why the government would not legalize all drugs and all narcotics and just make it a business and tax it and so on and so forth. Where in a lot of other countries, the the violent crime rate goes down, um, uh, uh, imprisonment goes down, prison population goes down for crimes like that because it's no longer illegal. You know, it's regulated by the government and so on. Um, less people in the methadone clinics, less addicts, less, you know, crackheads, less of all of that if you just make it legal. Um, why they wouldn't want to do that, I had not thought of this before, but, I mean, I was kind of aware, but not really cognizant, that there are a lot of things that the government gets done and branches of the military get done with money that is off the books. So you think, okay, we know the idea of, you know, black ops. 
you know, operations in the military that the government sanctions that are off the record. You know, they need to topple certain regimes in certain ways, and they need to set up certain things by CIA, military joint operations to go in there, Delta Force, and kind of just handle the business. And it's dirty and it's grimy, and you know, it's very, you know, anti-hero, you're doing something bad for a good reason kind of thing, quote unquote. Um, but behind that is money that you can't trace. All these military contractors that are out there in Afghanistan and the Middle East and so on and so forth. So when so when America's got to, they need to handle, they need somebody to be handled. They, the CIA liaisons with these PMCs, private military contractors, and they've got their own teams there on the ground so they don't have to ship troops over to go and handle the business. And they get funded and they get millions of dollars to be able to do that. And there are people who are private mercenaries that work for those private military corporations or companies that do that. And it's like, okay, it would then make sense for the CIA slash DOJ slash etc. powers that be, whoever it may be, because other governments do it too, to, to pay for that with money that is off the books, that is not traceable, laundered money. Where would you get that laundered money? You're not going to go and just print money. That takes a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of signatures to happen, a whole lot of red tape to happen to get that money printed just for us to go use it. And then, you know, in inflation in the market and things like that, uh, you, you, you would get it from, from drug money. You get it from money accrued through certain nefarious means. And it's sort of like a means to an end. Uh, how did I go down this kind of rabbit hole? Yeah, it's people really think, going back to this, like, to COVID and, and oh, make sure that you this and make sure that you that and make sure that you... People don't be doing that. These politicians don't be doing that behind closed closed doors. And, and, and oftentimes when they do it, they don't even be doing it right, which is so interesting. Like, we got us down here, the average folk... You know, we out here doing our thing, the citizenry, trying to make sure we stay safe and keep our neighbors safe. But these politicians out here like, oh, you need to do this, oh, you need to do that. They don't even be following that. Half the time, they really don't. It's really interesting. And they don't keep track of it. And oftentimes, they're not ashamed of it. Very interesting. They're not ashamed of being called out for it or anything. That's a thing, That's a thing to me, too, in terms of, like, audacity. In terms of, like, personal personal sort of backbone, moral upstanding. And I'm not necessarily trying to be like, oh, I'm more moral than these people, or I'm more this, no, 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 It's just, these are things that I've noticed. Like, yo, what up? If we, gotta, if we need to do it and, and it's safe, why aren't y'all doing it? Or if we need to do it and it's safe, why is there so much, why are there so many, why is there so much hot mic footage and so on uh, of you being suspect with all of these safety measures? What's up with that? What is up with that? You know? And so getting certain studies incorrect, it's really interesting. Super interesting. Anyway, that'll be another podcast. I think, I'll, I think I might do a little deep dive, or I might even refer y'all to, to a few videos. I've got some other content creators that uh, that go into it deeper, that have done you know the research and got the super cuts and try to be a little, you know, uh, try to be uh, cool about it. I might even put uh, uh, one of their links in, in the description as the rec for this, uh, for this podcast. For this episode, episode 30. Ah, 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 gang, gang, we out here. But uh, let's shift over. So Marvel, I think I talked about it before, they got the rights back for the Netflix characters. So for those who are unaware, uh, Jessica Jones, Iron Fist, Daredevil, and Luke Cage, and The Punisher were all on Netflix. There were live action iterations, for those who might have missed the boat, there were live action iterations of those heroes on Netflix, and it was a joint thing, joint contract to create those shows. Uh, Marvel did a little deal, and they were able to do, they were able to produce those shows on Netflix. This is before we, they, they started doing, before Disney Plus was around. Excuse me. So, those shows ended, and there was, in the agreement was there this cool down period where Disney slash Marvel couldn't do anything with those characters uh, for a certain amount of time after the contract was over, after, after they didn't renew the contracts. And so that time has passed, and they've now gotten all of their rights back for those characters to do depictions of them, but I believe that they have to change the, the depictions of the characters a little bit as to not have that sort of synergy with, the, with those shows. They've got to look different. Uh, they got them all back, and I'm pretty hyped. I think I said it before that I was hyped. 
Uh, I assume the Punisher is going to come back and, and, and be on Hulu because of the blood and gore nature and rated R nature of that of that show. It's not going to touch Disney Plus. But um, I'm super hyped. I am super hyped. I want Jessica Jones to come back. The same actress, Miss Ritter. I would love for her to come back. Uh, why I bring this up is because the rumor is that Charlie Cox, the gentleman who played Daredevil in the Netflix series, is going to make an appearance in the new Spider-Man movie, which they just uh, they just uh, debuted the title in a really cool, funny video. I might put that link in the description. Really cool little teaser. I really like how tongue-in-cheek these movies are. These this new iteration of Spider-Man, I really I really like it. Uh, it's a breath of fresh air to me. Uh, they may not be like the the most ironclad, like they're not the greatest. They they don't live up to Spider-Man one and, and Spider-Man two, Tobey Maguire. They don't live up to that. But they're trying to be their own thing, and so I can respect that thing and think that thing is super cool and super awesome. Uh, but the rumor is, and I think there have been. The idea that this rumor has some legitimacy is that there are some court scenes that they're filming with Spider-Man in the courtroom. And so it would be amazing. For those who haven't seen Daredevil, the Charlie Cox Netflix Daredevil, try and find it somewhere. I don't know if it's still on Netflix. If you can find it, watch it because it is amazing. Legit amazing. Even the season or the part bits of seasons that are not quite great, it's still fine. It's on a different level. Uh, but I would be hyped. I would, <coughs> excuse me, I would be absolutely hyped if, uh, if Charlie Cox would like just pull up. You know, we're maybe two thirds of the way into the, in, in, into the film and I, I could see it as a cool little publicity thing to try to get goodwill for Spider-Man because for those who do, did not see Spider-Man 2, Far From Home, spoilers, 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 scrub ahead, y'all. If y'all haven't seen it, y'all should have seen it by now. It's been out for a minute. But, but by the end of that, Spider-Man is fighting uh, Mysterio and Spider-Man, Mysterio inadvertently kills himself. Like Spider-Man is like, nah, dude, chill, what up? And dude tries in his attempt or wanting or desperation to kill Spider-Man, the explosion kills him and doesn't kill Spider-Man. Spider-Man is able to get out of there, able to, to jump, dive, dodge, and so on. Now, so we think Mysterio's over, it's done. Finally, you know, uh, Nick Fury uh, made it happen, killed this threat. But then by the end of the film, and end of the film, I, don't, I forget if it was an end, an end credit scene, I don't think it was an incredible I think it was actually part of the end of the movie. You get, you get uh, the little bit where he he gets to grab, take Mary Jane, take MJ, and uh, swing with her in real time, so she can see how it feels. And it was it was horrible. <laughs> How they depicted it, which is so cool, I like this kind of cheap thing. How they depicted it was like the most horrifying thing ever. <laughs> and she was screaming and flipping out. Then and she's like, let's not do that again. And it's a cool little nod to Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man when he saves MJ in Spider-Man 1 from Green Goblin. Because Green Goblin wants to take out all the CEOs of, 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 of Oscorp that try to like, they edge him out of the board. And so he vaporizes them, and, and, and Spider-Man comes, and he saves MJ, because MJ happens to be there. Watch that movie. It's fire. Uh, but Spider-Man saves her, swoops in, swings, saves her, catches her, and just, like, swings away with her and puts her on a rooftop. And so that it was so, like, nice and graceful, and the scene, and you see her face, and she's, like, looking around, right? And this is, like, the complete opposite. If someone were actually to grab you and swing you and with that G-force through the city, hundreds of feet in the air, it's not necessarily going to be the most pleasant of experiences for anybody the first time. So that was pretty cool. But the end of Spider-Man, you get that scene, he stops off, the other thing, I think it's right by Madison Square Garden or something. And you got the big screens right there in Madison Square Garden. And we get J. Jonah Jameson in this cinematic universe, has his own like sort of podcast, kind of internet show thing, a la uh, Alex Jones kind of thing. And he... Has has an exclusive on Mysterio and his um, Mysterio had sort of a sort of a death protocol 
So when he died, this video got released of Mysterio telling the world that Spider-Man is Peter Parker. So for those who did not see that, it's not. So now, the next film title, No Way Home, Spider-Man No Way Home, he's got to figure out how to deal with this, with this craziness. So now everybody knows that he's Spider-Man. Or part of, the pop, part of the world or population believes that it's true, and another part does not believe that it's true, that it's fake. Uh, so I could very much so see, oh man, it would be lovely. I would flip out. I would start. I would start clapping in the theaters if the theaters are open and safe. I would start clapping if we get Peter Parker, Spider-Man, you know, in his suit. He's not revealing that it's Peter Parker, but just for the PR to come in, sort of like Hancock. If any of y'all have seen that movie with Will Smith, I wish that they did sequels to that. That was fire. Will Smith as a, as a superhero would be pretty cool. So I, I hope at some point he gets to be part of the MCU. I think, I think that's a proper sort of marriage of actor and character if he could get to be a superhero. Hancock was a really good example of how that works. Just his personal persona in the world, like in the real world, and being a superhero, I think that would, that would be pretty cool. Hancock was a cool proof of concept. But if you haven't seen that movie, go out and see it. It's fire. Jason Bateman, Charlie Theron, pretty cool. Uh, yeah, there's a point where he's working on, he's a superhero that is just, he don't care. He's a god among men. He, he doesn't understand what his purpose is. So he's a, he's a boozer. He drinks, he, he just, he helps people, but it's like halfway. So he'll do more damage saving people than, than would have happened if the thing continued and so on. And so Jason Bateman's character comes in to give him a better PR spin to turn him into a superhero. And so in that movie, he, the government wants to hold in the city, because I think he's in LA, he wants to hold him accountable for all of the billions of dollars of damage that he's caused over a long period of time, saving people. Quote unquote, you know? And so he, Jason Bateman's character, is like, okay, you need to, as a as a as a show of good faith, you need to subject yourself to the law. And so he's found guilty of all of the damage and all the thing, and they put him in jail. And at first they're like, oh, this isn't gonna work. You know, he could just break out, he could just hop over the fence. He's a super, he could fly away. And you know, while they're going through it, it's like a little montage where he's like, do I need to be here? Do I need to do this? And he starts sort of refocusing himself um, and understanding that there's a bigger thing at play here than just, oh, I need to go save people or, or whatever. You know, it's really that he needs to find himself and who he is because he doesn't know who he is. We find out. He doesn't have mem certain memories past a certain point. And so it's a cool thing because he stays in there and then the crime rate starts to go up and then they want him back. And so when he comes out, he's got the full suit, he's got the thing. So I'm saying all of this to say, it would be amazing if we get that kind of a scene where, where Spider-Man's got to come in, talk about the death of Mysterio, because right now people think that Spider-Man killed this guy who was quote-unquote trying to save London. Watch that movie, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Uh, and so he can go on trial, sort of, and... Uh, as a PR move to try to plead his case on like, this isn't really what this is. And it would be amazing, amazing. You know, nobody wants to represent him. Nobody's ever tried to represent a superhero before, a, a masked vigilante before. Uh, so no, 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 no lawyers are won't want to take his case in New York City, except Foggy and Nelson. And freaking, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Nelson and Murdoch, my bad. And, we just get, we get the scene. And it's like, do you have representation? You know, he's there, Spider-Man. And he's like, I don't, I can't. No one will think. And he looks sad and he looks thick. And Murdoch pulls up Charlie Cox. We don't get to see Daredevil as a, as a, like a Daredevil dude. You know, in a suit or anything. Just Charlie Cox coming in as Murdoch to, to represent Peter Parker and represent Spider-Man. Oh my gosh, we get the scene where we just hear the thing open and he walks in, he's walking in and, and, and he's blind, you know, he's blind and he's got his thing and he goes, I'm his representation, your honor. And he pulls up and he thinks 
and then he goes over to the other lawyer for the city or whatever, and they're talking with the oh my gosh, it would be amazing because Charlie Cox was so good, like as an actor. Oh my gosh, it was amazing. Y'all need to go see Daredevil. But anyway, I'm hyped about that. There's other rumors that that we're gonna have. I don't. We talked about in the last podcast, the podcast, the episode before about Tom Holland talking about how uh, Toby and Garfield are not going to be in the film. Andrew Garfield told Tom McGuire, but that he doesn't even really know because he's only dealt with 70% of the script and they're still filming it, so he has no idea. And Marvel keeps stuff from him anyway. It would be easy for them to film some kind of green screen thing and he just lied to him about what he's dealing with. It's happened too. Um, I just learned, I watched the Star Wars documentary on Disney Plus, which is lit, um, about sort of the, the development of Star Wars. Uh, I think it went from the beginning, from A New Hope, talking about George Lucas and his journey up to, I think, episode two. But um, it happened like that, too, on the set, where they would say certain things or do certain parts of The Empire Strikes Back and say it a certain way. And so then when we they saw the movie, they would, in ADR, um, have different dialogue or, or, or some, they, they would change it to what it's supposed to be. So then the actors don't even really know what's happening. They were very tight, tight on what the story and the script was and, and not letting it leak out. So people didn't get the whole script. Only George Lucas and a few other people had the full script, had the full story. They do they do that a lot in Marvel. I said that the previous episode. So the it, what Tom Holland said has not killed the the rumor mill about Andrew Garfield being attached to the movie, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch as Doctor Strange being attached to the movie, uh, uh, Charlie Cox being attached to the movie, and uh, Toby Toby and, and, and Garfield. I think I said Garfield. Being attached to the movie, so we're gonna see. The, oh, and Alfred Molina is attached to the movie, who played the uh, who played Doctor Octopus in the Tobey Maguire universe of movies, which was amazing. Spider-Man Two. Oh my gosh, that is one of, if not the greatest superhero movie ever made. And um, Jamie Fox, he'll be Electro again from the Garfield universe. So if we're getting these two characters that are the from these two, or we're, we're characters from these two universes, it's safe to assume that these two Spider-Men are going to are gonna pull up. But anyway, I'm hyped about this. I hope you guys are hyped too. Please let me know in the comments. Y'all, are you guys excited for this new Spider-Man film? Or are y'all like, oh, okay, whatever. You know, it's just Spider-Man. And I think Tom Holland's, Tom Holland's contract is going to be up with this Spider-Man movie. And they're going to have to re, they're gonna have to re-up. I assume he's going to be excited to, to re-up. Because I think Sony's trying to do a, 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 a Sinister Six movie. So he's going to have to be in it. Spider-Man is in. Uh, switching gears to the DCEU now. I'm pretty, uh, I'm kind of, kind of ground swelling getting hype. I saw the trailer for the Zack Snyder Justice League. And I don't really, I'm not a fan of the DCEU. And just the look, like the Zack Snyder, his version of these characters, or the look of that universe and the feel of that universe, I'm not too I'm not too happy about it. I'm not too happy about a lot of decisions that were made, all the choices that were made. I'm happy about casting. I think Ben Affleck makes a great Bruce Wayne, great a really cool Batman. And that iteration of Batman that we got in Batman v Superman, um, there were things in the movie, writing wise and story wise, that were absolute basura. Absolute. If you know if you knew anything about uh, the Dark Knight. Uh, rises, rises, returns. The Dark Knight Returns, the graphic novel. Uh, it's whack. And if you know anything about the uh, uh, the Doomsday, then and the Death of Superman story arc, it, this movie is trash. However, what they did get right, and I think what most people unanimous, unanimously agree on, is that one scene, if you haven't seen it, or if you've seen it, that one scene where Batman goes to save Clark's mom. And that's just pure Batman, batman -y. Now, I think it gets a little bit too brutal. Like, one or two of these guys is probably all the way dead. Like, Batman has a, kill, has a, head, has a body count in this movie. He had, he's had body counts before in other movies. Has a body count. But that was getting Batman right, in my opinion. It was a way to bring in the sort of comic book animated series Batman, 
who is a regular dude, but seems like he, he's, it's a heightened reality where he can do certain cool things. Super sleuth, he knows mad, different martial arts and stuff. That kind of Batman. And so, like, not all the way grounded like The Dark Knight, like Christopher Nolan series. I think they got that right. I think they got Jason Momoa and that characterization of Aquaman. I think they got that right. The casting of, him, of Henry Cavill as Superman, they got that 100% right. They got the right guy, I feel. Like, aside from his look being good and his dedication to his craft of acting and being that, I think they got the right guy in that he is a fan. Like, he is invested in DC heroes, in being Superman and understands what that is in terms of how he's he's a he needs to be a role model for younger people how superman is that kind of beacon and so when we got some of these movies that superman was like you know basura uh he had his own feelings about that he thought that was a little and so and which is what which is why we haven't gotten another man of steel or one of the reasons why like he's been saying that they've been working on it but he said that he wants to get it right. If we're going to do another Superman movie, we need to get it right. And it was an interesting thing because I think he's going to want to have input on the, on the script. If they do another Superman movie or a different iteration of Superman and he's Superman. So I don't think he liked the, a lot of aspects of those other films. Of The Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, and uh, Justice League. Because um, you don't. He doesn't get the moments. That character in this world, Zack Snyder world, doesn't get the, do, 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 the moments that this is the guy. This is the dude. And and what's his name? Um, Joss Whedon, with all the scandals that he's going through now. But Joss Whedon coming in to retool the Justice League movie. As much as that was a very Frankenstein cut by the end of it, um, he did try to give Superman that moment. He tried, when he pulled back up, Superman pulled up, he was, Joss Whedon seems to earnestly be trying to get, to inject Superman back into that movie. To inject, you know, truth, justice, and the American way Superman into that movie. Not the uh, 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 Ian Rand, uh, you know, dour mentality that Zack Snyder had brought in. Now it's a vision, it's a way to go, and Zack, Zack Snyder is his own, you know, he's an auteur, he could do his own thing. The studio clearly liked what his direction was and wanted to hang their DCEU, their DC Extended Universe and films on that sort of skeleton. Uh, but uh, after he, you know, the studio seemingly saw or saw the early cuts, early pieces of the Justice League movie, they were like, yeah, no. How about we work, we go in a different direction. So, and now they've things that back to get some publicity for HBO Max and have him re have him finish his vision of the movie, have him finish the movie that he was filming. Things that'll be a two-parter and it's gonna be super long, like four hours. So, uh, I say this the, the DCEU, give me my back thing that I don't really necessarily like it. In its whole, I don't like it. But there are certain things that got that, that they got right. Uh, um, is oh yeah okay so we're gonna talk about flashpoint flashpoint the flash movie oh my gosh this flash movie has been in production hell for mad long they get a director they lose a director they have a script they lose a the script they get a writer they, they lose a the writer they have a, a script that they think they're gonna film then nope complete rewrites all over again uh ezra miller has it hasn't put on the script doesn't have input on the script. Has input, doesn't have input. What I do like is that Ezra Miller, at least in this interview, seems like he's very passionate about this character. I don't like the characterization of this character or the look of this character um, or a lot of the little nuances of this character when he's when he's flashing, when he's doing this thing. I do not like it in the DCEU. I don't think it's a very... I'll say it's an inspired take. It's a take. But I feel like it's not... It doesn't hit the marks for me, the checkboxes for the Flash, for me. And as, I don't, I don't think it's Ezra Miller's fault. I'm not saying Ezra Miller's trash. I just think he was given the script. He was given a suit to put on. He was given this character. Um, hopefully, this Flash movie will rectify that because it's going to be Flashpoint. So hopefully, with this Flashpoint movie, they can retcon 
the universe. So when this Flashpoint movie happens, if y'all haven't seen the animated movie, the Flashpoint movie, go and see it. If you haven't read the comic, go and read it. Or even just go on Wikipedia or whatever. You can get the Cliff's Notes. Um, they, can, they can very easily use this Flashpoint in terms of this is like their multiverse kind of thing. They can use their Flashpoint movie to retcon the universe. So they can make it like Man of Steel didn't happen. Or certain aspects of that movie was different. Um, that might be Superman. Certain aspects are different. Or maybe it didn't even happen. So the world can be something different and we can get a new a more um, fan-friendly, comic book-friendly, ethos-friendly, uh, mythology-friendly uh, set of characters. And we could just, bam, just pop them. We don't even have to give the backstories. We could just, this is Superman now. So then you could debut new suits, you could debut even new actors in different roles right after that even within the Flashpoint movie. So like by the end of it, when he comes back to his time, and yes, it's a time travel kind of thing, multiverse travel kind of thing, when he comes back to his universe and his time, we can get the, the, the Christopher Reeve, Henry Cavill, Superman. You know, we can get the uh, Aquaman, the proper Aquaman, and so on and so forth. So I'm pretty hyped about that. But I'm talk I'm, I'm, I want to talk about and give a little shout out to Sasha Kage, uh, landing the role of Supergirl in Flashpoint, in the Flash movie. So I'm pretty hyped that we got a Latina, you know, Colombiana, in the role of Supergirl. I'm wondering if they're gonna, no, they probably won't. Because often, or when you, the depictions of Supergirl is that Supergirl is blonde haired, and Superman is usually black haired. So maybe they might just, I was thinking, are they going to put, put her in blonde hair or like dirty blonde or something, a dark blonde? And I'm like, I hope they don't. I hope she's a Latina and I hope that they just leave her black hair. Because they're from the same family. She's Superman's cousin. For those who don't know the Supergirl mythology, she, Kara is Superman's cousin and is older than Superman, her, his older cousin. Um, there, were, there was kind of an Easter egg in the Man of Steel movie with uh, Supergirl, where you see when he finds the old ship with the codex in it or whatever, the ship that, that's that I, did he come in that ship? No, he didn't come in that ship, but it was like an old exploratory vessel, Kryptonian vessel that was stuck in the ice and so on. That sort of was the shout out and became like his Fortress of Solitude, sort of. Uh, he, um, there were pods there for like when they go into hyperspace and they have to go sleep for years and years and there was one that was open and so people were like oh my gosh that's the little setup for, for Supergirl um, I'm, I'm, I'm hyped I'm hyped that we've got a Latina doing her thing I'm, top of the, I'm hyped that they decided to go that way um, I believe she is known for the young and the restless I just want to see how this is going to go I'm not even you know let's get it Get out there, girl. Get it. Get that bag. Get that check. Sign that contract for four or five movies. And do us proud. Do the Latino community proud. Do the South American community proud. Central American community proud. You feel me? Uh, so I'm, 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 I'm pretty hyped about that. Then switching over to some trailer news. I know y'all have to have seen the Mortal Kombat trailer. That went all over the place. I think there's a, there's a PG version and then there's a Red Band version with all the blood and the fatalities. I'm here for it. I feel like this Mortal Kombat is going to be pretty cool. They're going to do what they've been doing in the games, Mortal Kombat 11 and so on, and, and the, 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 the struggle between the, the two clans and then Scorpion and Sub-Zero and so on. I'm not a fan of the sort of every the sort of everyman character that they're introducing that will sort of function as the audience's gateway into, the, into Mortal Kombat, into the tournament. I don't like the tattoo thing. I feel like it's corny. I feel like it's played out. I feel like it's early 2000s, 1990s kind of stuff. We didn't need it. Uh, so so that we have that weird, oh, chosen one kind of, I don't think we needed that chosen one kind of thing. Uh, that we have that, and we have the, you know, completely new character made for the film. I feel like it's a lot. I feel like, no, no, no. I was going to say that that'll be the place where the movie wanes. But there's another aspect of this that I saw in the trailer that I'm like, ah, it's probably going to be good, but probably could be a lot better, are some of the fight scenes. 
So when we're seeing that little bit of Sub-Zero and Scorpion fighting each other, I feel like their movements are too slow. The fr how they filmed it, I feel like the it's too it's too sluggish. It's taking too long. So when we see that sort of little really cool ice integration that Scorpion does, I feel like all those movements are too slow. And so the slower you go, the more unrealistic it feels. And I know we're not. It's not necessarily supposed to be the most realistic thing. But when we've got films like John Wick, knowing that it's not realistic. And it's like amazing combat, cool, pragmatic stuff. And we've seen the games. I feel like these moves should have been scaled up. They should have been filming this at a lower frame rate and then bumping the frame rate a little bit back to normal to get that sort of quicker, snappier, more fluid motion. It felt too long. Uh, the, 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 the sequence of that, he kicks them through. He makes the ice thing, he kicks them through the ice. It felt like it took a thousand years. Like, oh, 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 okay, there's more? Oh, oh, okay, okay, all that to kick him through the ice. It should have been either less movements or make it snappier, make it quicker, make it more fluid. So I feel like if the fighting in the movie, if that's an indication of what the fighting in the movie is going to be like, it misses the mark, 100%. I would even say that the, that the original Mortal Kombat movie would beat the new Mortal Kombat movie out in fight in fight scenes uh, if they're going that slow and trying to do all these elaborate moves from the from, from the video games. So video games don't go that slow; they go quicker than that. Um, but yeah, that's my thing. I like that trailer. I'm hyped for it and hope that if it goes well, they get a, a second chance at it and they could punch it up in the next movie. Because you got to you know you got to take take it to the next level. Have them move a little quicker. You know what I'm saying? I'll probably have a, a link to that Mortal Kombat trailer below. Um, but I, I am I am hype, just you know, trepidatiously hype, you know, timidly hype, just kind of hype, but it's in the bottle. The bottle's not it's not all the way open. A little hype. Uh, I like the casting in that in that too. It, it looks the casting looks great, except for maybe Sonya, but it's a thing. I just don't like how I feel about that actress. I mean, it's not even that I know the the, uh, the rest of that actress's work. I don't. But I didn't like the trailer. Like, what the interactions were in the trailer, her acting in those scenes. Didn't seem, didn't seem like I, I could gravitate towards it. But, uh, let's get it, yo. Mortal Kombat is happening. We, we live in a time where it finally came back around that Mortal Kombat could be a movie that gets made again. After Annihilation, it was... No one. We're not making a Mortal Kombat movie ever. So I'm pretty hyped about it. What else we got on the docket today? Haha. -ha. Six Flags. Yes, Six Flags. For those of y'all who don't know, I am a huge, huge roller coaster fan. Um, I, I love roller coasters. And I've been to. There was, was it? It was two summers ago. Uh. I had the ability with uh, very special someone's uh, to go and uh, have a little tour of Six Flags's Six Flag Six Flags's Six Flag a tour of the Six Flags theme parks on the eastern seaboard, eastern east coast. Uh, <clears throat> um, didn't hit all of them, wasn't able to, but just took took some time off and uh, just we did a we did a road trip. And I went out there, and it was a blast. I had a blast. We had a blast. Uh, we went to Six Flags Great America. We went to Six Flags Great Adventure. And we went to Six Flags uh, in Massachusetts. Ottawa, Ottawa? I think that's what it's, where it's at. Something like that. Six Flags Massachusetts. Um, and we hit, you know, the Hurricane Harbors. Of the ones that had. We hit them. Uh, and it was it was great. Had a blast. Wanted to do more than wanted to hit other ones, but you know they're, they're going to be farther away. I'm forgetting the location. Uh, the one in Massachusetts, the Ottawa, and um, Great America. It's not Georgia. I, I forget. Um, I'm blanking out. 
But uh, it was wonderful. Had a great time. I like Six Flags. As, as an organization, what it was doing for its parks were pretty cool. It's not like Disney, you know, where Disney, you pay the premium for all of the people walking around, themed uh, uh, individuals and actors who walk around in character. It's not quite the same kind of dedication to that immersiveness. But Six Flags was fire. I feel like Six Flags has got more of an edge than Disney, than the Disney World, Dis Disneyland parks. More of an edge, and you don't get as much crazy traffic. Like, I hear the horror stories of being at Disney World or Disneyland, and the lines are like two, three hours long. Six Flags, at least Six Flags Great Adventure, not quite as bad. Sometimes in the summer when you're there at a certain time, it gets nuts. So I've been to Six Flags for their uh, Fright Fest, which was pretty awesome. Um, I was a person up to a few, it was a few years ago that I started going for Fright Fest. And I had kind of wanted to go to see what it is for years and years and years and years and years. I mean, I'm a child. Remember when they had the little Coca-Cola uh, advertisement, the little Pepsi can, where you get, like, buy one, get one free, or 700% off tickets and things? I'd been to Six Flags maybe once or twice when I was younger, but then that's it. And not for Halloween. You know, I come, I come from a family who didn't really, who didn't really push celebrating Halloween, uh, even though kind of did, a few sometimes, uh, but it wasn't a thing. Some religious things there, but uh, on and off it was a thing. Didn't never got never got the chance to, and I was kind of scared too. I'm not necessarily a horror person, like horror movie person. I didn't necessarily like being scared and like watching blood and gore, which I think is a whole other masculinity pride thing that we could jump into. Because I um I had a problem. Talk about personal note. Now we're going into story time. For anybody who 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 could identify. You know, let me know in the comments. I had a problem letting my guard down to allow myself to feel scared. So, like, I would feel scared on the inside, but it would manifest itself in a protective mode. I'd go into protection mode. Um, like, I have to fight something. Like, I have to, you know, something's coming and we have to fight it kind of thing. And I would shy away Horror was not my thing. I didn't want to see... And then on top of that, I'm a, I'm a kind of sort of squeamish person. So horror and blood and gore, it's, you know, a little throw up kind of thing. But I wouldn't... I felt like I should not be a scaredy cat of those things. I should not be afraid of those things. So it wasn't like I was afraid, like, if I'm sitting down and I have to see it, I'm going to run away or I'm going to start crying. I mean, when you're a child, if you see horror things, yeah, it could probably make you cry. But... As an adult, no, no, no. It, was, it wasn't like that as I got older. It was more so that I don't like that it, it does this thing to me and ramps me up where my fear gets turned into like competence, physical protection, fighting, you know, fight or fight mode, fight mode competence, like an, an extra aware. I didn't like that it revved me up in that way. And so I would stay away from it. Uh, and it wasn't only until a few years ago that I had to look deep down at myself and go, listen, dude, you want to be the best version of yourself. You want to be the most complete person that you can be. You have to let yourself feel. And part of that, I mean, I, I had issues too with sort of expressing sadness and, and connecting with sadness and sorrow uh, before. And, I, and I'm, I'm still working on it now. Presently, because, you know, we're all works in progress. We're all developing peoples. We are not just a snapshot of who we were four months ago, and that's who we are for the rest of our lives. Um, I said to myself, Marcus, no, you need to open yourself up and feel scared. Be scared and not even be afraid of what other people are going to think about you. Because I think part of that was that, too. Because it's like, oh, men should not be scared of anything. If you're a man, you shouldn't be afraid. Or else, some, or else somehow you're less of a man. I know we're getting deep. Or somehow you're less of a man. But that's how I felt inside, culturally, that that's what that was. Um, and so I would fight against showing that kind of fear. But I was like, dude, this is a safe environment. This is an environment where it's welcome to be afraid. It's okay. Yeah, if you're jumping up and down and running away, it might look silly. It might be look laughable. But it's part of what, it's part of what, what life is. You know, we have fun. We have... We, we, we joke, we enjoy the moments. And this is, this is just one aspect of enjoying the moments. Keep, be open to being afraid. 
be open for something be to be eerie and creepy and feeling all of those creepies and stuff. Because then how could you be a complete person? How could you really understand other people? How could you uh, understand yourself completely or think that you understand yourself completely if you're not okay with being afraid? And so a few years ago I went to uh, Fright Fest and it was lit. I enjoyed myself. I gave myself over to it. I, you know, it was a safe space. Do your thing, man. We're not going to like make fun of you or make fun of you because you got scared. It's supposed to be scary. It's supposed to scare you. That's the point. So I had a great time. Anyway, so Six Flags is my jam. It's my thing. The main park that I go to is Six Flags Great Adventures out in New Jersey. Ah, 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 gang, gang, Great Adventures. The best park. The best Six Flags park in the entire world. At me. At me in the comments. I have no problem going at it. You feel me? I will put El Toro up against any wooden roller coaster you could, you could, uh, you could throw at me. El Toro is it, is the creme de la creme, is the se magnifique wooden roller coaster. Um, it is the attraction. I will put King Ka up against any magnetic roller coaster. I will put, uh, is it magnetic? No, I think it's a slingshot. It's a magnetic slingshot. I will put it up against any. King Ka's been around for like 15 years. El Toro's been around for mad long. There's a reason. You go to Six Flags, I mean, you got COVID now, but before COVID, you go to Six Flags and the line is the longest for King The line is the longest for El Toro. Even Nitro is still fire. So most people say, don't at me, at me in the comments. Let me know what's your favorite roller coaster. Where have you, uh, where have you uh, gone to? What theme parks? And in, you know, whether it's your, your childhood or now, let me know your fondest memories of, of theme parks, you know? I have a great time at Six Flags. I go to Six Flags 25, 30, 40 times a year. I'm good. I've been for, for Christmas. They have a cool Christmas thing that, that goes on. Of course, pre-COVID, they had a lot of stage shows and things and performances, which was amazing. Uh, Pre-COVID, Fright Fest, they had Hollow Fest this year, but Fright Fest pre-COVID, you get cool haunted mazes. You get people walking around, the haunted themed areas. They had this cool like kickoff for this this zombie thing. Oh, it was awesome! It was amazing, and you get like dance performances, and magician and all kinds of stuff. It's pretty fire. But anyway, I bring up Six Flags one because they just finished the Jersey Devil, which I think is going to be whack. It's a single rail roller coaster for for you roller coaster enthusiasts. I feel like Jersey Devil is going to be whack, even though it's probably it's going to be the fastest or whatever uh, single rail roller coaster. Okay, single rail. Give me some inversions. Give me some loops here. Like, why do I want to do single rail? Um, but they just finished the track. They're still building it out. But big news is that they will be, Six Flags is going to be open again come March. At least that's the plan pending, you know, if the government regulations change, then they'll be closed. But they're going to be open again in March. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty hyped. I probably won't go in March. I'll probably wait. No, I'll probably. Who am I kidding? I'm going to be there. Uh, it's going to be fire. They're, I think what's really cool for COVID is that there, and Six Flags has not sponsored this. The Six Flags company has not sponsored this, pod, this podcast, just just, just letting you all know uh, and putting it out there. If you all want Six Flags see this, I would love to be sponsored. Thank you very much. Uh, I have no problem. All right. We out here. Gang, gang. Uh, they, they switch. They're switching over to completely paperless stuff, uh, paperless transactions completely for the whole park. So you pull up and you're using your card. And for people who have cash and don't have the card, they can, one well, of the sounds of the city, y'all, they can, uh, they have machines where you can get a card, a cash card, for free. They don't have to pay for the cash card itself, which I think is fire. They recently, they put up, because uh, of COVID, they put up like the cool body scanner kind of things. Oh my gosh. The lines going in used to be nuts. It's like this now. I love it. And then I'm like, you know, I'm a, they have this really cool membership program uh, that you could couple with like a, a, they have a dining program too, and you could put that together, uh, stack that onto that membership, and you get all kinds of discounts on food, free food, the whole shebang. It's fire. Y'all need to get on this. You know, if you have a family and you want to do memberships and things, it's fire. They do all kinds of giveaways, all kinds of uh, free stuff that you get every season. Uh, uh, ride photos, different kinds of foods that you can get just free off the rip. Um, 
Uh, they just open up a bunch of new restaurants. Like, it's fire. Y'all need to go. If y'all haven't gone, maybe y'all are a little t- scared of roller coasters, pull up, y'all. It's fun. Especially if you go early. For those of you who are going to Six Flags and don't know, get to Six Flags when it opens. It may seem like, oh, yeah, we know that. This is what you do. You get to somewhere that's going to be crowded uh, early. No, get there early. Plot out what you, the rides that you're going to hit. And get them done when you get in the park. Do not meander. Because the lines will get long. And then because it's COVID, because I've been there during COVID. I went there for Christmas during COVID and before that. And in the summer. And it, um... It's not the... I, I would say COVID has negatively impacted Six Flags. Um, in terms of like the, the theme park experience. Because they have... Met, you got to mask up. you got to socially distance. They have hand sanitizer everywhere. They only allow a certain amount of people on all the rides. So it's staggered in the cars. Um, in the trains and the cars of the roller coasters. But because of all of that, because of all the social distancing... The lines are longer. They're just physically elongated. And it takes longer to get on rides because everything is staggered out. There's only a certain amount of people in each car of each train. Um, they can't throw everybody in there. You know, rightfully so. But just letting y'all know, when y'all go, go in the morning and get it done. Sometimes, I mean, if you're a member... They'll open up like 15 minutes earlier. Like you get to get in the park 15 minutes earlier than the general population. And so you get to that. When they started that, that stacked up with my, you know, how I do it. How I have a route and a plan when I get there for when it opens. So that I hit the rides that are the best rides that I love the most, that I have the most fun on. Um, So then by the time I'm done with those and doing my route, Gen Pop is really flooding in. And then we could do other, other things. You know, me and my group could do other stuff and chill out and, and have lunch and, and, and go to go and go and watch a show or go and uh, go to the arcade or go do some of the games or get on some other smaller rides. Uh, it um, it's a thing. It's a thing. So with that, when it's stacked, when the memberships, because I have a, a plat, uh, Diamond Elite, which is the you know, uh, our gang gang, we out here in NYC, we doing it. Um, you get to get in 15 minutes before. The jam pop. And so hit that. I go to my route. Yo, let me know which all routes are, especially all the other parks like Cedar Park and so on, Hershey Park. Let me know, y'all. Bush Gardens, let me know which all routes is. Um, but I do, and let me know what your routes are for Six Five Great Adventures for those who go uh, in the comments. Let me know. Uh, I do, I get in and we do uh, El Toro, then I'll do Bizarro. If my group will do it, because the Bizarro ride used to be the Medusa, and they never really like changed the seats and the restraints, or like updated them, because when you get in those restraints, oh man, they don't come all of the way down enough, and you're like jostling all the way around, and it kind of it hurts, it hurts. Uh, but I do Bizarro if my group will 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 want to do it. If it's the, the, the if it's summer, I'll then do the log flume, get something like some, some nice and cool down. Then I'll take the tram across. There's like a cool Skyway tram, which is fire. I recommend using it. It's a beautiful view of the park. Tram across. I've got Skull Mountain there. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll do the Nitro next, because that's the one that gets lines like crazy. And then I'll do uh, Skull Mountain, which doesn't get crazy lines. It's not quite as popular as it used to be. I mean, it's still, with, with social distancing, it's going to look like it's popular because now everybody's got a distance out six feet, so the line physically looks longer. Um, do Skull Mountain, and then I'm down for the smaller rides. So I'm, I, I never, ever touch the Batman ride, the original Batman ride. Never touch it. I, I did it a long, long time ago. It was fun, but... It's an older roller coaster. The ride is very, 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 very it's very rough on the body. And I'm, I'm good. I don't need it. It usually develops a long line on it. I don't know why. It's not a ride that I love. Uh, but I'll do the Dark Knight ride. It's a nice, cool little mouse uh, mouse track 
kind of thing. It's not a long ride at all, and they, they do the theming is pretty cool. I really like the uh, theming with the Dark Knight trilogy and the Joker and stuff. Pretty fire. You see a video in the beginning. It's all done like Gotham uh, subway system. It's cool. And then the Wonder Woman. Let me let y'all understand. That Wonder Woman, Lasso of Truth, it's a, it's a pendulum ride like this that goes like that. It does not go upside down, but it's the tallest and the fastest pendulum ride, I think, in the world. I think. Uh, it's fire. It is fire. And the, the length of the ride itself, like how many swings that you do, is really good. It's really good bang for the buck. Um, and how high that you get, and the G-forces that work, even though it doesn't go upside down, it goes like over the halfway point for the circle, and then comes down and goes over. That's how high it gets. You start going really, really fast coming down. Oh my gosh. Even the most hardened people that are roller coaster people jump on this joint and are like, I don't even want to go on this again. That was crazy. I love it. It's cool. And so what it will do is it will pendulum and it will spin as well. So that's pretty fun. So I'll hit, I'll hit rides like that. Um, there's a cyborg super spin that I've done once. I don't really, it doesn't go fast enough for me. It doesn't go, go hard enough. Um, and then there's a there's the, the Justice League, the Hall of Justice uh, uh, ride. It's like a virtual gun ride. I go to that. So like all the other little rides after the big three roller coasters, which is uh, uh, Nitro. Oh, and then I, I have to go to Kings of Ka. I do that too. Um, Nitro and Kings of Ka are kind of close to each other, but not all the way. Um, there are pathways between the two, but those only open up for Fright Fest. And even then, you know, the mazes are there in that area. Uh, but I got to go to King of Ka 2 very, very, very early because that, of all of the rides, that fills up the fastest for those of you who like Six Flags or who are interested in going. King of Ka is the most popular ride at Six Flags still, and it gets, it gets the most, the line fills up like insanely fast. Like fills, fills. So you got to go there and get your rides in early, super duper early. Yep, but I hit El Toro first, and mind you, you get in if, if you're a Diamond Elite or, or you're, you, you, you have a membership, because there's tiers, a tier of memberships. You can, um, you get there early, and if, there, if, you, if you're on the ride and nobody else has pulled up in a row, you stay on that. And I have another ride. So back when COVID, you used to pull up real quick, you used to run. Then when people used to come, like we used to ride like once or twice, there would be nobody there um, in our row, in the first row. First row, ah, 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 gang, gang, every roller coaster, first row. Uh, for, the, for the prime experience of the speed and the roller coaster, do that. Go to the back for a different kind of reason and, do, and hit the middle for a different reason. Uh, different kinds of Gs, different kinds of forces that are working on the, on the, on the cars. Um, hit El Toro. I mean, they, they, they knew us. We used to pull up. We knew people, like, by first name. Like, yo, what up? What up? Really cool dude there, Ben. I hope he's still there. I don't know in all of this COVID. Uh, but he, he has another job, day, uh, another day job, and just does this, just to do it because he loves it. And we've seen Ben for years, chilling on ride, like, yo, what up? So uh, El Toro, yeah, I'll, I'll go there, and we'll, and we'll go there. We'll do it, like, the first two times through in the first row. Then people will come in the first row. Then we'll go to, like, the second car, so, like, the third row. Do that maybe two times, and then jump to the next roller coaster. Same kind of deal. So we hit the Nitro, and if there's nobody in our thing, just go as many times as we can, and then we're gone. So if you're there early, you could do that. That's a, you know, that's a thing. Uh, so you could get all of your thrills and everything, everything that you want to do, and then get like all of the, all of the content for the buck, all the bang for the buck. You get that really early, and then by the time lunchtime rolls around, you're ready to eat lunch. You're ready to chill. You're ready to yo, that was fun, yo, yo, yo. Got your ride photos, everything, and you don't have to be sitting in line in the sun, standing in line, waiting to get your turn. With you know, crying babies and. Little kids being weird and being trash, no little kids. Gen Zers. You know, you don't you you don't gotta deal with that. You just you hit it early. And hook it up. And then you're able to walk around and 
play games and win prizes, and that's sort of that's what we'll do. And also, pro tip, juh, 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 shout out to Bro Science. I wish I had the sound effect, but I don't. Bro Science Live, Don Mazzetti, check it out. Really funny stuff. Uh, uh, pro tip, do your shopping at Six Flags on your way out. Don't hit, when you do theme parks, don't try to start hitting the stores when you first get there or like inter intermittently through as you're enjoying the theme park uh, because you're going to be walking around with mad stuff and if you're wanting to go on other rides, you can't take that stuff with you on all of the rides. And I don't necessarily always like having to throw my stuff off to the side if I have a whole lot of stuff because, you know, I don't want people to grab it. I don't want fights to break out. I don't want anything like that. Six Flags is cool because they'll tell you don't bring anything with you on the ride. Depending on the ride, you know, or, or what the what the roller coaster is, like how the restraints are, what the roller coaster does, they'll be like, yeah, no electronics, no nothing, and so on. And so they have little lockers that you could do. And they have a really cool thing. I don't know if other theme parks do this outside of Six Flags, but at least the one at, at Great Adventures has a cool little locker system that you can set up where... You can pay a certain fee, which is super cheap. You pay a certain fee to use that locker one time and go to another locker use it one time, a different locker. Or you could pay a little bit more and move your reservation around, your locker around. So you pay, I think it was like $8 or something like that. And it like, if you keep, if you think for two hours, like it'll stay for two hours. And so you come in, do your thing, throw your stuff in the locker, go do the ride come back, get your stuff out, go to your next ride, and then do switch my locker. And it will move that locker to where you're at now, the different locker bay by the other ride. And there you go, and you do that for the whole day. Pretty cool thing, pretty cool thing. But so what I'll say is, those lockers are like, like that squares? A foot and a few inches? No, a little more than that. Maybe a foot, no, a foot and a half? A foot and a third? Something like that. A square? You can't fit mad stuffed animals in that. And I wouldn't want to. You know, it's dirty. So what I do as a pro tip is do my thing all throughout. When I'm done with the rides, like I'll have my cutoff. Like, okay, I'm done. I hit all the rides that I wanted to hit multiple times. I don't think I want to hit any more. Now we go shopping. Now we do all the fun activities. And I'll walk around and holding all of the bags and holding, holding X, X, Y, Z. Thankfully, Six Flags Great Adventure specifically, their shops are right by the entrance slash exit. Most of their shops. Yeah, because they've got, got one on this side, they've got another few on the other side, but they've got shops right there. So you could take it from the farther parts of the park, farther parts, I'm going out here like I'll see, farther parts, out, for those of you who are watching, farther parts out of the park, and then you just work your way in. And then when you're coming out, it's like a thing like this where it's a square, and you've got other other shops there and food and things, and you can eat and so on, and get all of the bulk of your stuff while you're on your way out. So then, okay, we're done, we're, we're done doing everything that we have to do. We literally finished everything that we have to do, because by the time we walk out of the shops, that's the exit, and we're done. We ate, we had fun, all of that, the whole day, and you end up, you end up where you start. That's how you should set it up. Don't end up all the way at the other end of the park, and you're like, oh man, it's time to go home, and then you have to walk all the way. Because they've only got one Skyway, and I don't think Six Flags, I would say Six Flags Great Adventure, acreage in terms of the walkways, I don't think it's big enough to have like a tram line that takes you places. It's not gigantic in that way. It's pretty big though, but it's not like that. So like the Bronx Zoo, where they have a tram system that you can get on and, and tour, tour guide system and things like that to get you across the park, across the zoo. It's not quite like that. But um, pro tips. So y'all got some Six Flags news, some pro tips. Oh, yeah, Six Flags will, will be opening for this spring, pending, you know. They've already been reviewed. They've already been, been, been vetted by government officials and so on as to what their protocols are, what their protocols are going to be. Uh, last season, they opened up to 25% capacity, and that was self-imposed. The government didn't make them do that. In order to keep people safe and still have them have an enjoyable time, they decided to open at 25%. Which I think is pretty cool, because if you don't have to open 25%, I get it. Y'all don't want to risk opening up 50, opening up 75%, and then people getting sick and COVID and then getting lawsuits. It was fire. I liked that they did that. They chose, it showed that, that they cared. The team at Six Flags 
at least great adventure. They really institute protocols, which is also why I like Six Flags. I say as a company, but really I like Six Flags Great Adventure so far uh, these past few years because the team that's running it, the president, the director, um, the marketing guy, shout out, um, they seem to want to do the things to make sure that people have a good time. They'll go above and beyond. If you see one of the black shirts walking around at Six Flags, that's, a, that's one of the head dudes. That's one of the supervisors. If you see a dude walking around with a Six Flags tag and he's dressed in regular clothes, that's one of the higher-ups. That's one of the directors. Shake their hand. Let them know, thank you so much for providing something like this for people because people are going through stuff right now with COVID and we need something. You know, I know there are the people who will say or who will still feel that it's not safe to go out and it's not safe to go around because of the danger, because of the, the, the spread, X, Y, Z. So it's implied here, y'all, that this is for the people who feel okay going out, being masked up, being socially distanced, and still being able to enjoy a theme park. Um, and I'm not talking trash or smack or anything about anybody else or any of the other people who believe that, oh, y'all yo, yo, shouldn't do that because it's not time to think yet. It's, I'm not comfortable with that. You know, you can still catch it with the masks and with the thing. It's implied that this is not for y'all. And also, I'm not talking down on y'all. If that's how y'all feel about what y'all want to do for your life and to make your key and keep yourself safe, more power to you. Do what makes you feel comfortable. Do what makes you feel safe. But for all the other people that are comfortable, you got some pro tips. You got some uh, some some info. You got some news for anybody who's an enthusiast of, of, of theme parks. And we've got a big one close to us. I know there's Ride Playland that's even closer to where I'm at in New York City. But Great Adventures, Great Adventures ain't Ride Playland. You feel me? It's a different. There's levels to this. Uh, so now let's switch over. There's some things that I learned that sort of re re motivated me or reinvigorated me regarding. Um, just getting out and doing what you do, uh, despite the hardships, despite the pain, despite the struggle, just getting out there and doing it for doing what you need to go do for you. Uh, I saw, I alluded to earlier, I saw this documentary. I think I'd, I'd seen the documentary years ago when it came out, but uh, I just got a Disney Plus subscription. Ah, 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 here. This is not sponsored by Disney Plus, but y'all know. Y'all know what the deal is. Y'all peep it. So uh, I saw the documentary, I forget specifically what it's called. It's, it's just left my brain. Uh, it, uh, it's chronicles just how everything happened with George Lucas and Star Wars and the development and the movies and a lot of behind the scenes, a lot of interviews. It's an older documentary and I saw it, I think when it came out, it covers beginning of George Lucas's career all the way up to uh, episode two. Of the, pre, of the prequel trilogy. And there were a lot of really cool things. So, so I thought that I knew mad trivia, mad things that happened behind the scenes, like really no Star Wars inside out. But there were still a bunch of things that I'd forgotten about and that I didn't like sort of put together. Um, it, when you, if you watch that, that documentary, I hope that you do. I believe it will be something fruitful for you to understand. Because we don't, in our mainstream culture, in our society, we don't, Oftentimes, we don't get to see the struggle of the artist. We get to, we only get served the finished product. Maybe we might hear some rumors and news along the way, but we get served the finished product, the sparkly, shiny, focus grouped product, and don't really care to understand all of the work that it took the day to day to get to, to, get to that, that finished product. And I, I think that in our sort of time of quick fixes and quick satisfaction, that if we can get more of a hold of what the real world looks like when it comes to manifesting, uh, manifesting your best self, when it comes to, to manifesting your best life, when it comes to manifesting contentment in, 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 in your life uh, regarding the work that you do and, and what you contribute to the world, um, I think we will be better off getting back to sort of slowing down a little bit and uh, 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 absorbing the things that we're getting served from the perspective of there's some real artistry going on here, from the perspective of, man, so many people 
took so much time to develop this to put it in front of me. It's 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 amazing. So much time and so much determination. Each creative thing that you see, at least that makes it to the mainstream, dedication had to go into making sure that that thing makes it to you. Real dedication, uh, real dedication, lifelong dedication. And so I was reminded of that when I saw this George Lucas documentary. Uh, George Lucas was a dude, a director, of the crop of directors like Steven Spielberg, Scorsese, uh, uh, I forget the other dude, I'm forgetting his name. Uh, they're like all of the same crop, all of the same sort of age group. Um, they're all they were all buddies coming in through 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 film school and things, and very early on as they showed, they had certain professors from way back then that George Lucas was very outside of the box. He was an outside of the norms kind of person when it came to directing films and creating stories and things. He was doing things that the other kids weren't doing. The other students weren't doing, I say kids, but they're, you know, they're, they're in college. But the other students weren't, weren't doing, weren't attempting. Um, and his thing, George Lucas, he wanted from square one to be able to be free to create his thing and present it out there to the world without necessarily a corporate system dictating to him what he can and can't do. He, 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 he wanted to be what we understand to be you know, independent filmmaking, an indie filmmaker. He wanted to be that or understood that if he needed to be that in order to, to make the movies that he wanted to make and tell the stories that he wanted to tell, he was okay doing that knowing that that would be the hard road. <coughs> Excuse me. Knowing that that would be the hard road for him to take. And so the, the, the documentary really chronicles how he went from, it was crazy. Um, it was wild. This dude wanted to be independent, wanted to do his own indie thing, started off trying to fight, and at the time, the the, the Hollywood landscape, the Hollywood system of old was becoming dated, was becoming not um, viable anymore. Uh, this was around the time of the Vietnam War. Like it was, it was just not working. It was becoming more and more disconnected. And so at that time, at that time, the heads of those studios started selling the studios to corporations. So like Coca-Cola, all these big corporate Viacom, all these big corporations started having interest in buying those studios. And so they bought out those studios. And that's when, in, around the 60s, 70s, is when focus grouping started, corporatized films started, where they started coming up with uh, specific kinds of formulas in order to get butts and seats to sell tickets and so on. That all kind of started to crop up then. Um, so George Lucas coming in, he didn't want to have to be subject to that. Now, he tried to sort of be in, in one foot in, one foot out. Uh, his first movie was, an Ameri was, I think it was American Graffiti. His first mainstream like film film. He was young, he had to be like 19, like 20 something. Uh, American Gra Graffiti, Ron Howard was in it. Young Kurt Russell, I think was in it. No, Young Harrison Ford was in it. Um, so he filmed that movie and then the studio came in after the fact and cut pieces out of it. And this was like his baby. Like he liked this film, making this movie and helping him write it and things like that. It was a depiction. He was a car enthusiast way back in the day in his hometown. And this kind of, it's a young angst kind of movie and partially autobiographical sort of, of, where, of how he grew up in the times that he grew up in. And so it hurt him. Like they came in, they said, we can't put this in here. We can't put this in here. And they changed a few things around, you know, without his purview as the director and as sort of the dude that had this, this vision for this film. And um, he didn't think it was going to do well. The, the, the studio didn't think it was going to do well. Even though they had edited it a little bit, they were like, this movie's not going to go anywhere. Because at the time, um, the studios were doing, or films that were being made were very gritty, cop movies, anti-hero films, and things like that, um, that came out at that time. And there was not a lot of, there were not lighter, fancier, fanciful fairs happening at that time. Um, you know, the country was in the throes of controversy and so on with Nixon and, 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 and uh, uh, Vietnam and so on. 
very tumultuous time. Race relations is a very tumultuous time. And so George Lucas felt like people needed more. They needed to be able to connect with their inner child again. They needed to be able to escape what's happening now in order to, uh, to be okay, you know, to get rest from everything that's going on in the world. And so American Graffiti came out. So first, George Lucas wanted to do Star Wars. And it was called The Star Wars. He had been developing Star Wars from before American Graffiti, before he started filming that. He was like, it was literally like, you know, writing down this, treatments, this, that, treatments, oh, so on and so on. Let me get an artist to, to pick what I want him to think. Just, just this is what I want it to look like. Can you make it look like that? And he wants to shop it and he wants to this. And he was developing it over many years before he ever even got the green light to start pre-production on it. And so American Graffiti is in the can. And then he asks, goes to the studio. I forget which one it was. Goes to the studio to, to, to try to get Star Wars made. And he was like, he had this huge story. I didn't even realize this before. But uh, Star Wars 4, 5, 6, the original trilogy, uh, New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, and the Return of the Jedi, he had the whole thing mapped out from before he ever shot it. And he was like, yo, I got this, in his mind, I got this long story. I don't want to, I'm getting the green light to do a New Hope, to do this, to do, to, to do a movie. I don't want to do all three movies and try to, all, the whole story, try to cram it into one. He's going to do, he surmised that he's going to do each of the films as its own act. So he could get the whole story in. And so they had started to do the contracting, and he was writing, producing, and directing the movie. And so they decided that he should get, you know, he fought to get paid to do all of those three things, which is a thing that was not common back in the day, back, 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 back then. And then he was like, yo, I need to make sure. Okay, so the, the long story short, because I'm, I'm about to go through the entire documentary, but Long story short, George Lucas persevered in that he did not want to deal with uh, with the studio system and wanted to have the freedom to make his own thing and do it the way that he wanted to do it. You know, succeed or fail. He wanted to be able to stand by what his work was without focus groups, without people adulterating it. He said, you know, if people are not gonna are not gonna give me what I want to give me, I'm gonna make my own and I'm gonna do it on my own. And so that first movie, Star Wars A New Hope, he had a deal with, with, with the studio, got paid doing all three roles, uh, but he made sure to put in that contract that he gets the automatic ability to make the second and the third one, and put in that contract that he gets a certain amount to keep a certain amount of the rights, and that he gets to keep a certain amount of the merchandising. And back in the day, that was un unheard of. Merchandising for films didn't really go very far. You know, no one bought stuff. Like, no one cared enough to buy merchandise associated with a movie. Like, there would be t-shirts and that's it. And even then, no one did anything like that. It was very rare. He, in his mind, he was already thinking about merchandising. He already saw in the business aspect. He already saw when this movie comes out, we want to have t-shirts. We want to have posters. We want to have uh, licensing. We want to be able to license this as a product which people didn't think like that back then. He was literally the guy that started this whole thing. So really a big theme of this documentary is that George Lucas is responsible, overarching theme, that George Lucas himself, the man, the dude, one guy, is responsible for evolving the, the uh, cinematic landscape, evolving how films get made, evolving it from the old system, into the system that we know today. It's because of one dude, George Lucas. Not because Steven Spielberg, not because Scorsese, because of George Lucas. When we get the idea of, 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 of actors going into trading in order to come into a role, for they go, they go train for three, four months and certain things to be good enough so that they're believable on camera, that's George Lucas with Star Wars. The sword fighting, the thing, there's whole training that they had to do. And it got kicked up with, with the Wachowski brothers. Um, who brought that back? The Wachowski brothers brought that back with the Matrix. It had died down a little bit doing things like that. Uh, but the Wachowskis, for the first Matrix, or for just the Matrix, Keanu Reeves, Lawrence Fishburne, and, and um, Hugo Weaving, and um, Carrie Ann Moss, of course, the, the Trinity, the three, uh, outside of Hugo Weaving, had to do it the most because they had the most fighting scenes. 
they went into intensive training with the Yung Wu Ping and the stunt team and, and getting tall martial arts and, and being able to do these scenes. That comes from George Lucas. The, the sort of pipeline that, got, that George Lucas created is the pipeline that gets used now. The pre-production, the, the whole shebang, the intricacy of certain films, so like Lord of the Rings, without George Lucas and, and Skywalker Sound and Lucasfilm and LucasArts and, and ILM, without stuff that they set up for creating practical effects and so on, without that pipeline, Weta could not exist, which is a modern competitor to Lucasfilm and, uh, and ILM and so on. Weta is responsible for movies like Lord of the Rings. Uh, George Lucas single-handedly from a business mindset with, with his motivation of if the studio, because by the time Empire Strikes Back came, Star Wars was a big deal. And so George Lucas said, listen, I now want to keep all of the rights for my movie and for my property. And he made mad money off of A New Hope and was continuing to make money because, and it was funny, even with the toys, because you know how meant all like the old school toys are now super collectible items. The toys are a super big part of the revenue that gets brought in in the merchandise. That, that revenue is a super part of why Star Wars is so bankable as, a, as an IP. Um, only one toy company bit on, getting, bit on getting the license to make Star Wars toys. And that one company, this was the 1970s going to the 80s, I mean, sold out in, in a heartbeat after A New Hope came out. To the point that they had a campaign where they were selling empty boxes because they couldn't manufacture them, the toys, as uh, uh, as fast as people were ordering them and were, were and stores were ordering them. So they would sell these boxes. This is a real campaign. You have to look it up. They would sell these empty boxes with like pictures of the of, of, of the figurines that came with a voucher a voucher certificate, and so you would get the toys when they came out. Like, for real, for real. That's how, and people would buy it, the boxes, and have the vouchers and wait for the toy to arrive, to be mailed to them. On another level, that's how Star Wars overtook the world from back then. That's, that's, that, 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 that's the kind of intellectual property we're talking about. And so George Lucas had made so much money that he said, you know what, I'm done with the studio. I'll use the studio for distribution so that we can get the film that gets done in the can, we can get it put in, put in the theaters. We, we, we've got to deal with them. We ought to go through them. But I'm going to fund the movie. I'm not going to be under contract with the, uh, 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 with the studio like that so that I can keep 100% of my IP, my intellectual property, and not have to share that with them. They don't, they don't get to share rights with what I created, with what my baby is. And so he stayed independent in that way and used his own money. He funded... Uh, Empire Strikes Back with his own money, with loans, with revenue that was coming in from, from the Star Wars IP in terms of merchandising. And it was only until the very end because it went crazy over budget, the uh, Empire Strikes, Strikes Back, that he went to the studio to finish the rest of the funding. And it wasn't that much. But he, he was like, I'm not going to go back to them and have them take any of the IP. But he was able to... He didn't want to give away any points to them. But the contract that he was able to draft with them for the ending part of the funding to finish the movie, like all the way, all the way finish it, um, 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 he was able to draft the contracts where he got to keep a crazy amount of the, of the percentage of, of the IP. Um, just because he had finished all of the movie already pretty much. It was just a little bit left. So for them to draft a contract with him to try to take a controlling percentage and stake of, of marketing and everything of, of this film, it's trash. Like, leak, like, why would you do that? You haven't put anything into this film. Um, so Empire Strikes Back came out and it was crazy fire. Now, mind you, when 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 A New Hope came out, the studio, because at that point he was under under the studio, they did not, um, they didn't think it was going to succeed. So they didn't put their hands on it. Because they were like, oh, just let this dude do his, his thing, and he's just going to fail or whatever. It was like tensions, like in the stockholders' meetings and the, the, and, the, uh, and the board. One of the producers from the studio had to go in and report about the movie, and it was not, not a thing. To the point that uh, 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 they had so much footage and so much, so much, that the original edit of the film wasn't up to par. 
So, so check this out. So then George Lucas took the film from the editor, the original editors, brought it to these other two dudes that changed the approach to editing films forever. So talk about George Lucas being sort of part of firsts in the film industry. Um, these dudes pulled up, and you'll see it in the, in, the, in, the, in the documentary, they pulled up and instead of editing the film to the, instead of editing the film to the actor's performances, which was the old fashioned way of doing it, which showed the film to be lacking in, in, in energy. Um, it needed energy, it needed a faster pacing, but based off of what was there with the actors delivering certain things in certain scenes, it wasn't quite working. So they took and edited the movie down from scratch again, from top to bottom, from, from scratch. Now, mind you, back in the day, I say editing, but for all of y'all young people, all y'all millennials, uh, we may know video editing like we're on the computer or we're on our phones and we're doing our things with different panes and different stacks and so on. Back then, it was snip, snip, glue, pull that out, throw that away, snip, snip, edit, okay, real film, put in the projector, how does that look? That was editing. Oh yeah, painstaking process. These dudes deserve like medals of honor. They used to edit films back in the day, the old way. And so um, they said, they instead of editing it to the, to the actors, they edited it, um, uh, not to the score, but they edited it for the pacing. So they didn't let the, the, the actors, what they're doing, drive what their cuts were going to be. They had in mind, did we make this an action movie? So when there's dialogue and things, they cut it for that in mind. So the editing drove the pacing, as opposed to the actor's performance driving the pacing. And that saved A New Hope in the editing. A New Hope, Star Wars A New Hope got saved in the editor's and um, just as an example of like firsts, so then we fast forward. George Lucas, off of Empire Strikes Back, he had already off of A New Hope, he, he started Industrial Light and Magic. He started Skywalker Sound, um, which is a, a, the sound side, doing the score, doing the Foley, the sound effects, and Industrial Light and Magic doing the, all the practical effects, which then turned into doing digital effects as well. And from A New Hope to Empire Strikes Back to, to, to Return of the Jedi, those companies had grown and developed into legit powerhouses of, of the film industry. To the point that other studios were coming to Industrial Light and Magic to do the special effects for their movies. Other studios were coming to Skywalker Sound and t with THX, because so, George, George Lucas owned that, owned that technology, um, to do the sound effects and the Foley and to, to, to work through the, 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 the scores, the compositions, the musical compositions for their films. He developed these companies to the point that he built a whole pavilion, a plot of land, Skywalker Ranch, to house all of these different companies and businesses so that everything got done. Anybody who contracted from Skywalker Sound and, and who contracted from a subsidiary company of Lucas Films, all the work got done in one place. Amazing. I knew the fun fact that Pixar, the company that would become Pixar, came from a company, came from a company that George Lucas owned and, and, and developed to develop 3D uh, technology for, for filming, to develop uh, filming or making shorts and films and cartoons in a three-dimensional environment on the computer. That eventually, someone else bought that out, or it wasn't Disney, but he sold that company, and then that company became Pixar. Wildness, right? Uh, uh, ILM is responsible for even developing technologies for video editing, uh, for special effects, it's insane. So you can imagine George Lucas selling off the, the Star Wars IP for billions of dollars. I mean, George Lucas, I'm sure, still retains some of the some of the um, some of the merchandising rights. So he's making money on the back end. Some of the likeness rights. So he's making money on the back end. Um, he probably just sold the IP in the way that Disney can do whatever they want with it. So he doesn't have any more creative control. It's no longer his to own. So he just gets kickbacks on the back end. Um, but this dude's got patents for technologies. Uh, ILM and, and Skywalker Sound are still doing their thing. Most of the movies, like the, the sound that you hear in, in those films, were done by Skywalker Sound. A lot of movies, films still, their special effects come from Industrial Light and Magic. 
Virtual Light and Magic and Skywalker Sound became the, the gold standard that other studios and other companies had had to look up to to develop themselves to as the example. Hence, Weta exists now. So y'all, I say all of this to say, watch this documentary, get reinvigorated um, to understand, or yeah, reinvigorated, get motivated to understand that it's gonna take trials, it's gonna take some pain, it's gonna take some loss, as you'll see in this documentary, George Lucas went through it. Stress, health problems due to stress, you know, marriage problems, everything. Believing in a vision, believing in creating something that is solely and wholly his vision that he owns, that he can stand behind, that he can stand by, that he can get by. For better or for worse, whether it failed or whether it succeeded. Understand that it's going to take work to live your best life. Um, to become the best version of yourself, it's going to take work. It's a process, day-to-day -day process. To uh, become more present and more content with the things, the things that you have, but not conformed to the things that, that you have to the point that when something greater comes or to the point that when it's time to strive for something even greater than greater than you have that you're going to stop and sit down and go nah I'm good with what I got that that takes work every day to go to not get too comfortable in your contentment that it takes work remember let this documentary because we see Star Wars and I like, oh Star Wars oh you know it's, it's part of our childhoods and it's part of our thing to understand what George Lucas had to go through, all of the naysayers, all of the haters, all of the, the, the studio that had to put no faith in him and no faith in this movie, the crew, because they had to go film in, in London for A New Hope in England, in South Stages, the crew did not have faith in that movie because it was the first of its kind, really, at that level and at that time. The crew would talk smack under their breath about this film. And this film is, you know, bollocks and, 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 and you know, it's a load of hard, you know, it's, it's trash. Because we're seeing this weird prosthetic person in a suit say this to this other person and we don't really understand what that stuff means. And it's just like it's never going to work. George Lucas took the chance, pushed his vision, his vision forward and stood by it for better or for worse. So... When you, I'll, I'll say this now, for those of you who are watching, for those of you who are listening. Take it as an example. There are plenty of other examples that we can look to. Right now, I'm talking about this one. Take, take, him, take him as an example. Yeah, he's rich, high on top of his tower now, and, and he kind of sort of became what, along the way, Lucasfilm became the thing that he didn't want it to become. Like, he was fighting against corporations, and Lucasfilm became a corporation. Um, and he, you know he's a billionaire and some might even just look at his race oh he's white and he could do that he came from a very humble place very humble place he didn't come from wealth um, and even the, 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 the profession that, that he went into didn't guarantee wealth he could be good have became a filmmaker and failed miserably from square one but he stuck with it and it is an example of sticking with it and persevering and not letting the haters get the best of you. Not letting those who say that, nah, man, this ain't gonna make it. Why do you even do that, fam? Like, what? Not letting, and in our modern times now, not letting all of those heads that you know when you're finally doing something out here, out in these streets, and, and pursuing what your goals are, and you see that the people that you thought were around you and were your family and were your boys and who were your people, and who were your sisters, and who, and who were your brothers, that you thought when you went out there and started doing your thing, they were going to be there for you. They were going to support you. They were going to tag you. They were going to, yo, this is my dude, check out his stuff, that they were going to do that for you. And they don't. Take this as an example that, as an example to still persevere. To still, to still go out there and get it. To still go out there and get the back. Don't let any of that deter you. You feel me? And that 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 hits all part all, all parts of your life. Out here and doing it in these streets could be you becoming the best version of yourself. 
you growing from the person that you were before to the person the person that you are now, and not letting all those people that knew you knew who you were then or or, or knew you then, that kept that sort of archetype, that sort of visualization of you for all these years, and 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 you've you're a completely different person now, but they want to treat you like you're that same person for back then. Don't let those people deter you from your goal as a person, from living your best life, from being the most present, from being the most content, for being, uh, uh, deter you from being the most content with what you have and not conformed to get greater, to be greater, to get greater, to create greater. Imagine if the world imagined greater. All right, y'all. So uh, I guess my rec is that documentary. Uh, I will also recommend. This is that. This is that time of the show. Thank y'all for staying with us for this long till we get to the recommendation. Even if y'all had to scrub through, because it's because it's I. Right. You know, if, if there's certain things that you're not necessarily interested in that we're talking about, scrub through it. You know, there's definitely something you could take uh, and enjoy from this podcast. A plethora of things. Um, so by all means, enjoy it. You know, hit that like, hit that subscribe button on, on YouTube, hit those stars wherever you're at, uh, comment wherever you're at, review the podcast if you're uh, listening to it under the sound of my voice, follow the podcast, you feel me, whether it's on YouTube or any, any of the other podcasting platforms. Uh, we're here, y'all, at Social Millennial Podcasts on, on socials. You can search us and find us everywhere else. Uh, my recommendations are that George Lucas uh, documentary. I think I'll put a link to it, but it is on Disney Plus, so you're going to have to get a Disney Plus subscription. All right, y'all? See that there? It may be on YouTube. I'll look it up and see if I can put a, uh, a link in the description. Um, my second rec is check out uh, channel if you want to get political and um, sort of get a snapshot as to what's happening, like the TLDR of weird things that are going on with the government now and that was going on before, like stuff that doesn't make sense, things that where these politicians are sort of saying certain things about how things are, but it's really not that way, according to the CDC and according to, like, their sources. Um, I'm going to link down, down in the description a really great channel. I think he's based in New York, NYC, ah, 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 gang, gang. Uh, Don't Walk, Run. Fire stuff, really entertaining content, and definitely hard-hitting. Um, if you're upset about political commentary that goes against your political party, whether you're a Democrat or Republican or Independent or whatever, you know, if you're that kind of a marshmallow that you can't handle it, 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 it won't be for you. Now, there's, there's not any crazy. It's still kid-friendly, kid generally. Um, but he goes in on all the parties, people just doing funky things, you know, like... Y'all said that, that this is what y'all are going to do, but y'all really lied. Or y'all are telling the general public uh, that things are a certain way because of X, Y, Z. But then we look and we go, no, it's not really that. Because this is what got released. This is what the CBC information is. This is what actually happened. This is what, what this operation was. This is what, like, but you're just being disingenuous and telling us lies. Um that happens on both sides, and he hits it. He hits it hard, and in a very entertaining way. Very cool, condensed videos. Enjoy, y'all. Don't walk, run. If you want to, in the comments, tell him that the Social Millennial Podcast sent you. You know? Let him know in the comments, here because of Social Millennial Podcast. You know? We got to represent. NYC, we out here doing our things. Uh, thank you all again for chilling with us. Uh, merch store is coming very, very soon. It's going to be lit. I mean, we're going to have everything from uh, shirts to hoodies to uh, mugs to cell phone cases. Like, it's going to be lit. Pillows, it's going to be fire. Y'all going to be able to purchase whatever y'all want to and support the channel, support the podcast um, so we can expand. You know, we got up to this point from expansion. It took time. It took energy. It took work. But here we are. We're on YouTube. We're still doing our podcast thing. So y'all definitely keep supporting. Send the likes. Send the comments. If y'all agree with what I'm talking about, comment. If y'all don't agree, comment too. We want to hear what y'all think. We want to hear what y'all are up to uh, so we can spark some discussions. You feel me? Now, uh, once again, at Social Millennial Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, chill out there. Get in touch with us there. Link up with us there. Follow us there. Uh, we're, we're on many other uh, podcast platforms. So if you're just listening, we're on, on, on Radio Public. We're on uh, Stitcher. We're on 
Spotify, we're on Apple, we're on Google Podcasts. Y'all can find us whatever y'all listen to, all right? We're on YouTube here. So if y'all enjoy it, enjoy it. Uh, have a great week. Make sure that y'all stay socially distanced. To make sure that y'all are doing y'all thing to keep you and yours safe and keep striving to be a better version of y'all selves. You feel me? In this crazy, crazy, wild, just off-the-wall world that we live in that seems to keep getting more and more off the wall. Your contribution. All right, y'all. See y'all next week. Peace.